Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kenny Clark Show. Plus, Nani takes a hard fall. Devin shuns his reputation. Chauncey gets a little too comfortable being on opposite teams from his girlfriend. Fessel is riding high. Nelson is feeling left out. Tori continues to go through it in a big way. And I know the show is desperate for some extra revenue streams, but holy hell was that spawn con over the top. It's the challenge. Rider dies episode 10 recap coming up right now. What up, my fellow challenge lovers? Welcome to The Challenge Historian, where we dive deep into all things MTV's The Challenge, past, present, or future. If it's happening in the uh, Challenge universe, that's the universe it's happening in. We're here to document it when it's in that universe and sometimes others. I am your host and dedicated challenge historian, Jacob Hollaball. Thank you so very, very much for being here with me tonight on this Wednesday night to cover the challenge, Ride or Dies, episode number 10, the first in the, I guess, back half of the season. This seems destined to go the full Double Agents 18 episodes, uh, so it feels like new format, new show, new half of the season, and yes, I am so dedicated to the challenge that I have stayed off the internet, stayed off the social media during this episode because at the exact same time as this was airing, so too, and still right now in this moment, we're now in Survivor Reunion airing right now live, and I have shunned it all the way Devin has shunned his supposed shady reputation to be here with you immediately post-episode airing. I will watch Survivor Maybe just stay up super late tonight and watch the rest of it. Who knows? Or first thing in the morning. Either way, I ain't on Twitter. I ain't on Instagram. We got to stay off all the social media channels until I can watch that live so nothing's spoiled. And speaking of Survivor, uh, while we already have mentioned it, programming reminders, Survivor finale that, yes, just aired or is in the process of airing, that recap over on the Most Likely 2 podcast feed will be this Saturday morning, the final of this season, me and my good friend Paige breaking that down shortly before I believe she maybe is heading to Challenge Miami, Challenge Mania Miami. I unfortunately will not be making the trip down there to hang out with CT and everyone else that's been announced for that. The Australia finale will be this Friday, breaking down episodes 9 and 10, ending the Challenge Australia run. That will be on this Friday. Again, if you are not watching that, if you're here for Ride or Dies, you haven't been listening to the Australia breakdowns because you haven't been watching the Challenge Australia, I implore you, it's well worth your time and energy. It's only 10 episodes. So, Go out, find those links. The easiest place to find it that I know of right now, they're kind of all over if you do some searching, but if you go to Twitter, at Happy Go Locky, L-O-C-K-Y, I don't know who is behind that Twitter account. It's one of the many, you know, kind of uh, secretive, whatever, spoiler-ish, but challenge fan, stan account, Twitter accounts. They, or whoever it is, has a great uh, thread of all 10 episodes, links to all 10 episodes, so at Happy Go Locky on Twitter. I know Paige at Most Likely 2 Pod on Instagram has had a lot of the links saved in her highlight reel. If you just search around the internet, you'll find them. It's a season well worth watching. Get through the little episode 3 and 4 lull, episode 1, 2, and then 5 through 8 are amazing, awesome, incredible stuff. It's worth watching. That finale has now dropped. I will drop the podcast on Friday, and then... Next week, uh, we'll be done with Challenge Australia, so nothing on Monday, but on Friday, I will have the top 20 cast members of the first 20 seasons, top 20 MVPs, or the full MVP rankings from the first 20 seasons that was, you know, meant to be a few weeks ago during the Rewatch Recap miniseries. We've saved it. We've been doing Australia in its place, and now for your little Christmas present, we'll get that top 20 cast members in MVP rankings for the first season. So that's what we've got coming over the next week, week and a half, headed into the holiday season here as for tonight. Episode 10, Ride or Dies. Let's dive on in and go straight to the storylines. We're going to tackle this episode mostly in order. We've got four main storylines or segments to cover here. And the first one... Really, while I don't want to do it, I don't think we're going to talk about it for very long. It is one of, if not the biggest story of the episode, and becoming quickly what we thought it always would be one of the biggest storylines of the season. That is Tori and Jordan. We get a lot of Tori and Jordan in the kind of opening segments pre-daily challenge of the show. And here's what I've got to say about it. This kind of mess, this kind of drama is something I obviously will admit anyone who's listened to this podcast for a long time knows 
I am usually a fan of this. I am rooting for this type of, you know, like some messy drama that stays below, you know, on the good side or the, I guess it's not even a good side, but the right side of the line of morality, if you will, before, you know, actual really horrible untoward bullshit happens. This is a horrible situation, but no one's done anything like, you know, criminal or anything like that. Speaking of which, glad to see uh, a challenge related criminal get actually his just due in court recently this week. If you know what I'm talking about, you know, and that's all we got to say about that. But back to this one. So yeah, me, plenty of fans out there root for messy drama. I mean, that's you know what this show and what reality TV is based around. But this one in particular, it feels a little too close to home. Um, I'm having a hard time with it. I think I've said that before on recent weeks. And I just really like both of these two as individuals. I was so all in on a season that now is starting to get a lot of love recently on social media, War of the Worlds 2, which it was regarded in pretty good standing when it aired. But it's slowly but surely, I feel like everyone's come around to what I felt like in the moment of like, that's one of the best seasons of all time. And slowly but surely, the more I think it over and someone shares this clip, and I'm like, I'm not even thinking about that part of the show. And then share this clip. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that season is just so unbelievably amazing. It is truly, an, it's, it's like, it is actually iconic. It is actually in whatever the top tier is in your mind of challenge seasons. It has to be in it. It's so freaking good through the whole thing. And I was all in on Tori and Jordan's story during it, not just their like romantic relationship, but just them being the two that, you know, leave the one team, go to the other, then win with that other team. I know Tori doesn't actually win, win in the end, but like pretty much wins, you know, they have to shave it down to only four people right there at the last moment. But anyways, so I like both of these people. I know not everyone in the fandom does, um, but I just, I'm, I get uncomfortable. I feel, I don't, I don't love, this at all. I just want these two to both be happy and move past whatever feelings and resentment and whatever is still going on between them here. Shout out to Devin and Anissa trying to help both of them go through whatever is going on right now. Good friend moments for both of them. Good friend points scored for both of them. It's very genuine. And, you know, Anissa talking to Tori multiple different times. Devin trying to have the talk with Jordan, you know, you know, have the little bro chats like part game, but part also like, Hey, like, I don't know who else in the house is going to do this. And that's like one of my best friends now. So like, I'm going to do it for her. So shout out to Devin and Nisa for them. Jordan does come strong in that conversation with quote, seems a bit hypocritical given the year she's had on global television end quote. And yeah, that was a brutal line because you know, this is just where it gets into like, he's not wrong. And, uh, you know, I, you think? Do you think Jordan feels a certain way now about skipping out on two seasons he probably was invited on or will would have happily they casted him on to avoid having to do this storyline, relive all of this with Tori, and now they're still having to do it anyways? Later, um, yeah, I think he does, maybe a little bit. Um, makes total sense why he, why she, why both of them are angry, still hurting so badly. His actions in this particular season, the last couple episodes, that fight they had an episode or two ago, it definitely looks a bit worse on his side, but overall, again, I just want them to both be able to work through this individually together, move past it individually together, and the ugliness to stop. I don't like it, and I unfortunately feel like it's going to get worse before it maybe, hopefully, gets better, but I feel like it's just going to get worse the next couple episodes, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to have a great time with it. Let's skip ahead then to the daily challenge, or should I say the advertisement for Puss in Boots 3 or 2, or I don't know how many Puss in Boots solo movies there have been in the Shrek universe. I believe this is the third. I believe this is a trilogy moment for them. I should know this by based on how much Puss in Boots content I just got in this episode, because holy shit, they've done SpawnCon before. Uh, I, I say SponCon a lot and act like everyone knows sponsored content, SponCon for short. Um, so that's, if you didn't know, that's what I mean whenever I've said that in the past. And I'm going to say it again a lot here in the very, very near future starting right now. They've done a lot of SponCon before, but they have never done something this over the top. I mean, last season on Spies, Lies, and Allies, we had the very fun Top Gun Spawn Con, which was really, really great and was the second time in a row that we had sponsored 
daily challenge for a movie that wasn't actually coming out, which was um, pretty great or was at least in the realm of the time that it, that movie was eventually going to come out because one season before that, very near and near dear to my heart, just total worlds colliding on Double Agents. We had the Fast and Furious sponsored daily challenge in the midst of the pandemic when that movie was no longer coming out. And if you know uh, anything about me outside of this podcast, I have one once upon a time, every once in a while, turn into an author out of nowhere, and I have written a book about the Fast and Furious franchise, Salute Me Familia, available on Amazon. If you're a fan of the franchise, you got to go get the absolute, you know, the ultimate fan's guide to it, written by yours truly. So go buy that if you like that movie. But that one was near and dear to my heart, but it wasn't over the top at all because it was just the name of the daily challenge because in the end they were like, we don't actually have a movie to promote because it's not coming out now for like two years because what the hell is going on in the world? So this one, you know, tops all of them. Plus, you know, you got your Burger Kings, your P3s. We had a couple of those in the past where they actually get like a bunch of food back at the house that I think they actually really enjoy versus like you get to go to a world premiere movie premiere. That's pretty cool. But even if the movie's good, it's a children's cartoon movie. So is it all that cool? And for these people, actually, yeah, like that's good exposure. And so good for them. But lots of Puss in Boots content. Can't believe Antonio Banderas makes a full-blown appearance and pulls a full-blown one-minute-long monologue TJ style about both the movie but really more about the challenge itself because then they make poor TJ – I mean – TJ is a consummate professional, if nothing else, all right? He's going to do his job. He's going to read what he's asked to read. He's going to say what he's asked to say. He's going to give his opinion when asked to give his opinion. But, man, they they make him read the full, like, three-paragraph logline of this movie and synopsis of this movie. They make him just do so much for this. It is insane. Does Antonio Banderas get an appearance fee, or is this just, you know, come with, like, general promo junket for the movie? How does that exactly work do i have to put him down in the stats book is now like antonio banderas has been on the challenge he has been on one episode which i think i have to because he was in the episode for like i mean he spoke as much in this episode as kenny had in the previous nine episodes up to this not counting this episode kenny gets a lot of love we'll talk about him in a little minute um yeah and then final thing on the sponsored content because i i know i can't believe i'm doing three plus minutes on it but the fact that this part actually matters um this part really actually matters i swear The fact that so many cast members bought in so heavily to this shows you a lot about why certain people continue to get invited back by production against the better wishes of a lot of the fan community that feels like they're never heard, they're never listened to. And even if it is the loudest voices in the room in the fan community and, you know, the online uh, social media accounts and whatnot, they they're speaking that because they have plenty of people who are backing it up and following them because of the things they're saying. And so everyone is kind of in lockstep on a lot of this stuff. And this was such a great example, kind of, if you pull back the curtain, one little layer here that, yeah, when you see a bananas and a Tori and a Devin or an Anissa or whoever, like, really getting it a Jordan specific like Jordan goes over the top on his confessionals he gives them the full-blown like I believe him I think I grew up and loved the Shrek movies when I was a kid where I'm Jordan and I are basically the same age so like yeah like I don't think he was like lying through his teeth or anything but he also went over the top above and beyond for it bananas doing the actual commercials for the freaking movie that they're doing in the middle of this so it tells you something about how production works how maybe they're making their choices that like you're making lives easier you get invites back for better or worse you play along makes lives easier you get invites better because the production likes working with you it makes their job and their lives easier even if it doesn't necessarily lead to the popularity of the show growing and instead shrinking so that was just a little a little nugget i picked up on let's talk about the actual daily challenge we spent way too much time on this but also shout out Love cats. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit more of the Puss in Boots related thing because there is a moment during all of this. Huge cat guy here. Love my cat, Jim. He's the best. Love him, love him, love him. Sometimes he's here for the recordings. He never says anything. He watches the show, though, a lot. And so, yeah, I, I fell for this. So, anyways, the actual daily challenge. It should have been awesome, and it wasn't. That's that's uh, that's my review. I might as I almost could move on, but I want to at least give a couple performance reviews here. But what a snooze fest! Because it's just just a complete wipe of the floor, one team or the other. The you know, if you are listening to the Australia recaps and watching that show, if you're not, 
Uh, this what I'm about to say is like the most mild of spoilers for the that season, which I again encourage you to go find the links and watch them. They're very readily available and watch because it's a great season. I really liked it. But there is a moment during that season where a team loses an elimination and they are told that nah, they can just stay. Yeah, just in no explanations given. And I had to finally relent on the fact that production does com- pull complete bullshit at their own whims and they you know they set stuff up at their own whims and this daily challenge feels like one of those moments that i've got to give in and be like yeah they liked the idea of one team you know being able to make this storyline of one team so good and so awesome and they got all these people and the other teams like not and they get the nice moments of the one team sitting kind of quietly in the living room be like oh look they're not confident in themselves and then they set up the first daily challenge to be What if we made them wrestle? The one team is built exclusively on strength and power and size, and usually that matters only one out of every five or six dailies or eliminations or whatever, where it's like, that's the thing, that's all that matters. And they give them one of them where truly that is all that matters. So that feels a little like production chicanery. It leads to a snooze fest. Horacio beating Bananas was maybe the like one single fun one. And again, Bananas kind of not taking it serious at the start of that round, doing his little Puss in Boots dance, you know, um, that he had to do for the commercial too or whatever. So it was a little bit of a bummer. A couple people to shout out though. Devin, in a loss, looks really solid, and I liked what he was able to show versus Nelson. You know, Nelson's very difficult to wrestle. He's done a lot of headbangers. He's pure muscle all the way through his body, and uh, that's a tough matchup, and Devin did really, really good. They had a long battle. They knock each other off together. Nelson keeps his foot on longer, but like shout out to Devin for showing another side of like, I'm getting a little better even in these departments. It's not like a win versus someone, but like it it was a good showing. Also good showing in one that was needed. Chauncey beats Jordan, and that is a big moment for Chauncey, not just because like you beat Jordan one-on-one wrestling. That's a bull. That's a big accomplishment on its own, but also Chauncey had so far this season, he came in and I was like, look at this fucking athlete. And, you know, like, I don't know anything what he's got on the brain side of things, but like, he's got the brawn. He's an athlete. He, you know, trains unbelievably and he's got, you know, a lot of the tools you need. And then we hadn't really like seen much. We Anything we had seen was maybe a little not as good as we were hoping. And so this moment was big for him to like first challenge without Amber and he gets something that he can be good at and he takes out Jordan of all people. That's a big moment. He needed one. Loved seeing that. We still got hope for Chauncey to be awesome in this game and in this show. Fessel takes care of business. He's supposed to, but those are the times where like you need to, especially a guy like him that everyone out there listening right now, most of you stop listening to this podcast. The number one reason someone would stop listening to me in this podcast is because of my takes on Fessel. Um, so uh, I get, which I totally understand, by the way, but I stand by all my opinions. And uh, yeah, this is a type of moment where, yes, he should win. This is, goes exclusively to his skill set, and he should hopefully win easily, which he does. And that's a good thing because he actually weirdly has the most on the line, maybe in this whole thing. Because, like, if he. If Kenny would have, like, pulled a little leg trip, which, by the way, again, we don't know the rules. We never do, which is bullshit. Tell us all the rules that you tell them. Uh, It seems like you weren't – not a single person tries any sort of, like, leg sweep or, you know, just going for the legs in general to try to knock the person off balance or, like, get them to fall on their ass. And, like, if you're Kenny going up against Fessel, that's your only strategy is, like, oh – I'm not going to like grapple with him and shove him off before he shoves me off. Like you got to do something sneaky and conniving. And uh, it seems like they weren't allowed to do that. But anyways, Fessel takes care of business, avoids any big humiliation. That's good. Also, I've got to say, doesn't act all cocky about it or anything. Just doesn't walks back and is like, okay, yeah, we're good. We'll keep it moving. Casey similar um, in a matchup that was a little bit more even, but she comes out and gets the job done and proves her, you know, what her status is on the competition side, the physical side of this game. Tori, the same. Anissa, the same-ish. It was versus Norris, and Norris is tiny. Like, she's a very petite woman, so, you know, but, you know, Anissa still does, same as I had said for Fessy. Yes, Anissa, you should, in this game versus that opponent, this should be very easy for you. Don't blow it, and she doesn't. She does it in a very easy fashion. So shout out to all those people. And then the key thing about the daily challenge that I clued in on is at the very end, TJ says, quote, 
This is one of your ride or dies you are putting in, so choose wisely, end quote. And at that moment, we know a twist is coming. We get back to the house, and now let's talk about the strategy and kind of the team chemistry that's going on between these two teams and the choices that are ultimately made here. The winning team, as a group, has to interrogate all four other team members of, this time, the males. Uh, it's a male day, they announce. And so that begs the question, is this format only going to last for two episodes, uh, two rounds? Because what happens when, you know, next week there'll be a female round and they can work the exact same because there's still four females left on both teams. And then the week after that, we're at possibly, depending who wins, only three guys on one side, which makes, you know, if they keep the exact same format we got right here, that makes the draw not nearly as fun, just a 50-50 draw who goes in versus, which I guess they'll just do that. I don't know. I don't, please, please, please don't like change things two weeks from now and like reintroduce Kenny and whoever loses next week back in that fast, which we'll obviously get to that twist here at the end. Um, but I don't know. It, it leads it leads me to some questions of like, you're still putting four in the draw. Doesn't feel like that can last for uh, very long here. Fessel's team goes from, you know, they're on top of the world coming out of the picks. They're on top of the world coming out of the daily challenge. And then very quickly, they are not on the same page. And if we fast forward a brief bit, you know, we realize they're not on the same page. They don't seem to have a strategy or a leader in the interrogation. If we fast forward to the actual moment where they have to vote in the arena and suddenly Olivia, Nelson, and Chauncey are all like, no one has spoken anything to us. None of us have had any conversations like what the fuck the whole group has to come together. And there's a very clear divide that has happened where it's like Olivia and Chauncey and Nelson, which is the kind of weird part. And like Fessel, you're the one that needs to keep Nelson in the loop here. And maybe even like bananas, you're smarter than that. Like at least keep him in the loop right now when you're in the winning side, like, come on. But uh, those three are left out and, there's cracks all around and this team's unity isn't exactly where they thought maybe it would be. And again, this, this, the linchpin of this, this swings a little bit on Fessel bringing Nelson in because Olivia and Chauncey, they have to know, and there's, you know, Tori makes the comment in the original team meeting that they all have at the, early in the episode where she's like, they've got four rookies, we've got two, and like, we like our rookies, Olivia and Chauncey, like, we like you, we swear, but it's also very clear, like, we've got two, we've got one male, one female, so... We all know who's going to, who's, if someone has to go home first, who it's going to be. If someone has to go into elimination first, who it's going to be. So Olivia and Chauncey probably already knew that. And this just confirms that like, yeah, you ain't a part of this, like do a good job, help us win. But when we lose your ass is in there, probably we're going to try everything we can to convince the other team that your ass is in there. And if we don't, we're going to pick you to go against Nelson being in on that trio then is a little odd and maybe the rest of the team, you know, is just like we're closer with each other or they feel like Nelson is too close to Olivia. I don't know. But uh, Fessel, bring in your boy Nelson or Nelson maybe could be the one that's like Fessel. Like for real, though, you and Casey, like bananas ain't got your back in the end of the day. Bananas got his back. And Anissa doesn't actually care about you guys. Like she's got other people's backs and like same with Tori and like Anissa, Tori and bananas. I know, Casey, you got uh, Nani over there. That gets you to bananas, whatever. But, like, I feel like there's a world where if Olivia, maybe she plays the, like, Nelson, you fucked me a couple times already. Not the literal kind, but, like, in the game kind. And you owe me. So, like, go get your boy Fessel. Bring him in. Let's tell him. Bring Casey in. And let's turn the tide on this team. I hope that happens. That would make for a way better show. Is it going to happen? Absolutely not. The interrogation room. It honestly feels weird. It's a, it's, it is intimidating if you're sitting in that chair, as Horacio says, but it's also just kind of weird with eight people sitting above the one other person. It, it's not so crazy. It's not like there's like way, way, way up above the other, but they're like kind of on riser chairs above the other person. It, it feels a little odd. It's, it reminded me of War of the Worlds, War of the Worlds one. Yeah. War of the Worlds one where they had, you know, it was like the, like you went into the courtroom and all the teams were like literally up on like bleacher pedestals standing in front of you. But in that situation, it was at least two people always standing beneath them. So it wasn't like you were standing there by yourself as like the one person below everyone else. I don't know. I felt a, a little bit odd about it, but I guess it, it is what it is. They have to build it how they have to build it. Um, 
final real thing on the strategy because ultimately they they pick Horacio and that's the right pick I think for them and it's driven in large part by Jordan and Devin proving their veteran strategy status both Jordan and Devin play this flawlessly Jordan and Tori little back and forth aside that ultimately ends in the right place with like she wants to back him and you know fight for him a little bit and he you know says like of course, I'm going to do that. I'm going to act offended because I want to be mad again, and I'm going to get mad at anything you say, but also, like, I'm going to, you know, that, like, I can never go back on my word in this house ever because I've, you know, been doing damage control on my reputation for a long time now and come a long ways with it, so, like, I'm not going to do that. But Jordan, he goes in and he makes it very clear. You put me in, it's a two-thirds chance that I get Kenny and I win. There's a third chance that I get one of the other two and I probably still win. And then he also hints at it should be Devin versus Horacio. If you really want to weaken our team, then, you know, you find a way to you put in Devin or Horacio and you find a way to, you know, get the other one in there based on the picks or whatever. Like you can maybe swing some deals, whatever. But Jordan, you know, he dominates his interrogation. He leads the whole thing off. He kind of leads the questioning until Tori butts in with her question or whatever. But like he makes it very clear, like, hey, you can throw me in all you want. But like, look who I'm going to have to go up against. And the fact is that like, I'm probably going to get Kenny and I'm probably going to win. Or even if I don't, I'm still Jordan. I'm still probably going to win. So like, this isn't the time to do it until you can get me versus a guaranteed, very strong opponent. I wouldn't throw me in there, which is smart. And they listen, Devin, same thing, kind of same thing. Well, same good strategy, different strategy, but good. He dodges all their questions that I love that moment. That's coming up in quote of the week awards. Uh, he makes it very clear, though, even while dodging all of his question that, like, play nice, go easy route by saying Kenny, or go big and say Jordan, who we're going to give Kenny. So maybe don't say Jordan. Say Kenny. We'll put in Horacio. It's the rookies. Everyone stays as happy as could possibly be of all the veterans here that were supposedly all working together in the first place. So he does a great job of strategy. Jordan does a great, great job of strategy. They pick Horacio. Ultimately, that is probably the right decision because you at least take the smallest shot. You're like, look, they're all, everyone's going to save. The only way Kenny is not going into the elimination is if Kenny pulls the safe dagger, otherwise he's in there. And so if that's probably going to be the case, then do the rookie rookie, kind of keep things, the temperature as mild as possible, or at least throw in Horacio versus Devin so that if Kenny is the one to pull that safe dagger, you think, well, then maybe we can find, we got a 33% chance that we could maybe get Jordan and Horacio in there versus each other, and that would really help our team. Now for the elimination and ultimately the twist at the end. The elimination. I really, really liked it, actually. I think this was really great. I kind of enjoyed the the mo brief moment where you walk in and you're like, are they really doing a fucking hall brawl like right now? Like, Oh God, good luck. Good Lord. Good luck, Kenny. And then you're like, Oh no, there's not, there's more to it. Fine. That's good. That's great. This, you know, very reminiscent of the vertical version that I thought a few weeks back, I was like, Oh, when they did the Amber and Chauncey beat Darrell and Veronica. And I said that one immediately, I thought back to Trey and Zach losing on DQ to Leroy and Ty, I believe is who they lost to on the DQ. This one actually was just the horizontal version of that. Four walls, you got to break through them. You can use a different instrument each one. It's individual, not partners, so you don't have to switch every other, which is ultimately what caused that DQ for Trey and Zach. But anyways, I thought it was really fun. thought it was really good. Um, I liked mostly that the peanut gallery could not really help johnny does give a little advice and if kenny really was going to go after those <laughs> like i think he would have turned around and went back but not as quickly um but uh goes for oh i see a bunch of locks i have to break through yeah let's get the wrench over the bolt cutters i, I get it it's the heat of the moment and so again he would have turned around but bananas gives that little piece of help otherwise no one else gets help so sorry I just got a uh, text message that I believe uh, the first few words I saw were survivor related. So I got to swipe that away and not look at that until don't people realize this, this person knows that I'm challenged first, even on finale night. So 
Leave me, I guess I got to put my phone away, social media away, everything. Anyways, that's not what you're here to listen to or talk about right now. Let's get back on point. The elimination was great. Horacio did a great job. It wasn't actually close. They make it look like there was a big comeback at the end, but that's just because 10 bolts takes a long time to unscrew, which was smart planning by them so that no matter even in a blowout scenario, which I believe this was, they would at least, no matter what, it would have been a very difficult for them not to have both ended up in that final bolt stage together even if in reality, I mean, they never show, which is smart of them, how many bolts Kenny had left. But I think it was, you know, five or six. I think he was pretty far behind. So Horacio 4 no, that's starting to be a big deal. Yes, one of those truly does not count. Like, it'll count in the stats book. It counts in his mind and everything. But the one versus Turbo and Tamara, I mean, the a memory game where you have 12 or whatever 20 people it was at that time 20 more more than 20 people telling you the answers um you know that one doesn't count uh similar you know how i felt about the jay and michelle one um and so yeah he's four and oh but he's a legit two and oh um one individual one partner and he's got two others that maybe have an asterisk but he's still got the win still counts he's still four and oh and i think he's definitely going to be in another elimination or more if he keeps winning so the record the Sarah Grayson, the Wes and Casey 5-0 and in a rookie season record is very much in play for Horacio. I think it could really happen. Now, the one thing that should be said about those, way more eliminations in this season than in those. I guess not that many more when it ends up being you know male-female alternating here. So that's in play for Horacio. Good win for him. Let's talk about the only thing that really matters, though, and that is that Kenny gets eliminated, but not fully he you know at the end we think i'm sitting there and i'm thinking what i believe i maybe said last week i don't know if i said it on here or i had a couple different uh conversation on instagram with a few of you out there listening shout out to all of you as always at challenge historian on instagram i know i don't post almost anything on there i one day will do a lot of social media content again i swear i'm going to we're going to pick things back up but I do look at it every day and respond to all the DMs. I love talking to everyone. So hit me up if you want to chat about the challenge. And a few of us did have some dif- discussions about, you know, what would be the case here with this new format. And I thought I was very determined that it was going to be they were going to announce at some point whoever gets eliminated, the ride or die goes home too. I thought that was going to be how the ride or dies were still paired together in secret. But instead, they go the opposite route. We find out that you go to some form of redemption house when you're eliminated and you wait there until your ride or die is eliminated as well. And if they are, then you both are. But until they are, you're still somewhat in the game. It's vague. TJ leaves it vague. We don't know when they might actually you know, be able to return. But I think I have an idea of what I would hope. I'll get to that in just one second. I will say about this twist, I like it. I do like it. I wanted it to be the other way. I think it would have been more fun. And also it would have meant a little quicker season, which I'm, I don't love. I know it's blasphemy to say, but I don't love an 18 episode season. I like a 12 to 14 episode season is my sweet spot of this, especially with the 90 minute episodes. I think we could do it in that perfectly fine, but it's obviously going to be way longer now and that's okay. I like it. Uh, yeah, the, the opposite would have been more fun, but whatever. This is a cool version of a redemption house. You don't actually have to do anything. You don't get to win your way back into the game. You simply still are reliant on your partner, on your ride or die. And that the fact that they don't know that, although, you know, a bananas and Anissa and Nani, they've been in this game long enough. They've done enough of this stuff. They know that, uh, you know, and even a Tori and a Devin being on the, the recent seasons, even a Fessel and a Casey on the recent seasons. know they're so twist heavy now. And all of these people have seen so much of this stuff. I feel like they've got have to have some sort of inclination, which leads me to what I really, 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 really hope is the case here. And that is don't reintroduce these people too soon. Don't have, you know, the two episodes from now where we get down to like, oh, there's not, you know, there's only six on each team and now we're going to immediately like we're going to reintroduce people and we're going to go back to the pairs or we're like going to keep constantly switching. Don't do any of that shit. Here is the only way that this works and this is awesome. And that is that if that redemption house just keeps filling up until we've made it to the final. 
wait until literally the starting line of the final challenge before you reveal this. Please, 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 because that will be fucking awesome if they do that. One challenge sooner, maybe. One final daily challenge where you reintroduce them, you do it as a pair, and it's like a purge scenario or something, maybe. But otherwise, ride this thing out until there's either three or four men and women left on both sides, and then go to the final, literally have people travel separate, have them not know, actually, you know, don't get the fucking, the laundry mixed up so people know who's still there or whatever, like it happens in quarantine recently or whatever, they all knew Bananas was there because of a laundry mess up, if you haven't heard that, he's tells the story over and over and over now, of course he does, it's kind of what he does with his stories, but anyways, back to the point, get to three or four people left on either side, have a couple fun moments of like, you know, like Casey's going to make the final because she's Casey. Of course she will. But like, since our only hypothetical example to go off of is Kenny's in the redemption house, have like three episodes from now, you know, there's four people there now hanging out. And then the next person walks through the door and it's Casey and Kenny's face has to drop and be like, ah, fuck. And Casey has to be like, wait, I thought I was coming to a redemption house. Like, no, we have to go home now. We're the first team. It's like both of us have been eliminated and they go home. Those little moments would be very fun. Like the reveal at the redemption house would be amazing every single time a la like a fresh meat reveal out of the van that would be amazing all of them like please 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 like not my ride or die not my ride or die but then also the reveal would actually be a great payoff to a twist if it got to the final and there was three dudes and three women and they were tj you know brings them out they've changed locations or something they've got to the morning of and as tj starts to reveal what the final is going to be he says but you're not going to do it alone. And then they, they run out and it's like, it's a pairs. It's exclusively in pairs just with your ride or die. They've been here the whole time. You can still win together. That's what I want. That would be the best ending. That would have a massive, massive effect and be a great moment and be a worthy payoff to the twist. I fear that they are not going to have it in them to wait that long. They're going to want to reveal this sooner and they're going to blow it. But you know, I'm going to hold out hope that they do it the right way, which of course is the way that I think is the right way that I just laid out. To the awards we go, best quote, best moment, episode MVP, starting with quote, I promise in the coming weeks I will get back to being able to record the episodes and actually play these quotes for you, but you're going to continue to have to deal with me just reading them. We got a lot of nominees this week because Devin was on fire and uh, Jordan and Tori were very prevalent. They're both very good in the confessional booth too. So we got a bunch to get to here. The first one is, not, I don't even have the full comment here, but Devin's callback to Nelson's dog in the bark comment uh, and the fact that they then play that moment is absolutely great. And Devin is himself a bit of a historian, at least of his time on the show, his seasons he's been a part of. So shout out to him. Second nominee, Jordan's quote, this is my game. This is what I do. Welcome. Get your pen and get your pad. Take notes, buddy. I am the daddy up here. End quote. If you know me at all in my personal life, I fucking hate the word daddy and everyone using the word daddy. It is, you shouldn't use it. Anyone listening? Hopefully that doesn't, if that makes you turn off this podcast, so be it. But uh, not a fan of it, but still have to admit it was a funny moment and a good quote from Jordan. Next up is Devin again, very prevalent in this category this week. Quote, the moment we've all been waiting for, Fessel versus Kenny, David versus Goliath. Only David doesn't have a slingshot. He's got a helmet and some knee pads, end quote. I like that a lot. Uh, did it maybe deserve to be nominated with a couple of his other things? I don't know, but I really liked it and he was having a great episode and, uh, yeah, he just knows how to even a mostly benign comment. He plays it right. He's got the cadence. He, he's got the delivery. It sneaks in there. Tori is up next quote, shout out to puss in boots because we put those pusses in boots End quote, Anissa immediate follow-up quote. Uh, we're going to work on that one. End quote. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to work on that one. Uh, but I appreciate I, I Tori went for it. She went for it. And uh, yeah, uh, it didn't didn't quite land, but I got a laugh out of it. I hope you were able to just only laugh at it too. four or fifth, fine, whatever. Fifth, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can't say words or count numbers right now. But the final nominee, the fifth and final nominee. Now I can count is Devin's quote. And by the way, this is also the winner. Pulling my best Neo. They're firing questions. Your boy's dodging them. Dodging them, giving answers, but not 
given answers. Do they even know what I just said? I'm not sure because I don't. I know it sounded good though. End quote. Just incredible. They, you know, they do the little nice effects with it. And he's just a professional in the confessional booth. As said and done, he's been great at it basically since he entered the world of the challenge, but especially in the last few seasons, he's just really risen to the top of just a guaranteed good quote, good comment, good narration, good everything in the confessional booth. Devin gets the quote of the week as for best moment. A couple of ones in this list that we haven't actually talked about. First one. Amber and Chauncey's little moving out moment at the beginning of the episode, I actually found really cute and endearing and I liked it. And I, uh, yeah, I haven't felt necessarily that way about some of the other little couple moments between them or some of the other couples on the show. I really liked this one though. I thought it was playful. I thought it was fun. I had a good time with her, you know, throwing his stuff out, kicking him out of the room, which I hope they're not actually like, we have to sleep in different rooms now because we're on different teams. Uh, maybe to get some Intel, I guess, but like, I don't know if I'm in the challenge house with my girlfriend, I would like to be sleeping with my girlfriend, especially now that those rooms, four bunks to a room, you, a lot of people are able to find a bunk to themselves, which because I'm not going to mention it, something else I realized, uh, another, the most mild challenge, Australia spoiler, uh, not really just someone who hooks up. So if you don't want to know a hookup fast forward 15 seconds, but the same bed Conrad and Megan hooked up in is the same bed Jordan and Narice hooked up in. So that specific bed of all the bunk beds in this particular challenge house seems to be the one, the romantic one, the one where things are going down. So, you know, shout out to that bed, I guess. Uh, second nominee, Olivia specifically sharing her cat photos. I said before, when I talked way too long about the sponsored content, now here it is again, more Puss in Boots kind of content. They do a whole cat thing. They, you know, they obviously run way too far with the sponsored content, but we get Olivia doing a genuine, like, I'm a cat mom. I got multiple cats. I take them out. I walk them. I push them in stroller. Like, I'm a weird cat mom. And I'm now, I went from an Olivia fan to an Olivia stan because I had, tried to hold off a little bit and just been like genuine fan. She's an amazing star of this show in this season. Everyone else was, you know, out there standing her. I was like, ah, it's, it's too much. It's too much too fast. I'm going to hold off. But like now I can't cause cat people ride with cat people, man. And I'm a cat person. She's a cat person. And I fucking loved it. I then also found it hilarious that then she, at the end of it says, you know, like in all of us, there's so many of us that love cats here. And then they just did a montage of everyone who's ever met Tori and formerly Jordan's cat Miso, the Sphinx, who is a wild creature, a uh, beautiful, awesome creature in cat Miso, the Sphinx. But I found it hilarious that they're like, yeah, everyone loves cats. And they're like, well, no, it's just uh, Tori and Jordan bought a cat the one time and Tori still has that cat and the cat's pretty cool. And you know, some people have visited and taken photos with it. So Anissa and bananas of all people and Devin all have a picture. So they show five people in a row with the same cat. And I'm just like, man, Miso really getting some screen time. Shout out to Miso the Sphinx. So love that moment. Third one, Fessel's face after Nani's fall. He, his face, he goes, there's a lot of movement in his face after her fall. He is horrified. He is astounded. There's some small part of him that's entertained, a la, you know, a TJ. Um, thankfully, if TJ laughed, they cut that out. They know better than, you know, like when someone gets hurt, whether he have laughed or not, and before realizing someone was hurt, they they make sure to not show that part. But it's only the only bad fall, but it's a bad one. She's real shooken up. She goes to the hospital, thankfully. She's perfectly fine. Just a really scary, rough fall. Knocks the wind out bumps your head you're like fuck i'm terrified of what just happened plus now i'm super fucking cold because i'm just floating in this ice cold water so thankfully that's all it was and nani is totally fine fourth nominee then i really enjoyed devin and jordan's interrogation specifically and like that they were back to back so that entire moment and then the fifth and final one the reveal of the format twist was really fun and really good, and I liked that one. They actually revealed it, or most of it. They left a little vagueness to it, but they like actually. It wasn't just like Kenny come back in here and then boom to be continued. It was actually like we're gonna tell you what's up. And I liked, I liked that TJ. You know that it was TJ and Kenny of all people that like Kenny was so front and center this episode for the first time ever, and so obvious that he was going to go home because of that fact. And that TJ had to do that with him. I just thought that was really great. But overall, of all of those, I'm a cat guy. She's the star of the season. Olivia's cat photos and montage. I got to give it to that. And then for episode MVP, 
which Olivia does not make the top five, but I mean, she, she honestly probably should maybe almost every single episode. So honorable mention to her, but top five, we start with Casey and Kenny joint one. They get between them in this particular episode, 21 confessionals. I don't have to count the rest of the, of the season. That is more in this episode than they had combined in the first nine episodes. That is insanity. And that is why, as I just said a moment ago, the moment, I think it was confessional number three. Yeah, it was confessional number three for Kenny where I was like, huh, this man's going home. <laughs> yeah, you just know. You, you always kind of know by the edits, but especially when it's someone who literally has had like six confessionals in nine episodes or something like that, five confessionals in nine episodes, something like that. You went four in a row without it. Um, you're just like, oh, you're done for, buddy. Like, sorry, brother. You're you're going home, or somehow, some way, Casey is. But then they're like, it's a male day, and we're like, yep, Kenny's going home. So shout out to them, though. They're they're very prevalent this episode, and it's fine. It's you know, it's not the most interesting thing, but it's fine. And they get fifth place. Horacio comes in fourth. A great win by him. He keeps his cool. He understands the situation. There's not a lot he can do about it, and he just he rides with it. He does all the right things, says all the right things, and maybe possibly. He might have another person who he's caught their eye. We'll come to them in a second because first we got to say Jordan is in third. Fantastic episode for Jordan, except for, you know, the relationship drama that I don't love watching, but it's still very prevalent for him. And then he has some fun, good moments in the interrogation and all that. Everything else does take that L versus Chauncey, which, you know, goes on the record, but it is what it is. He comes in third. Tori in second, the one who maybe has eyes for Horacio. Could we see that coming more on that when we get to predictions tory in second devin takes home the win though i think devin was the mvp of this episode he was so good in the confessional booth he you know he loses to nelson but has a good showing in the daily challenge he does good strategy he has a great friend moment trying to do the little bro talk half strategy half bro half i want to help my friend tory out talk with jordan and just overall um you know in in an episode that was a little a little ho-hum, a little like, let's just move it down the line because I think some good things are coming and we got to get to those things. Devin was a shining star that he often is, and he gets the episode MVP. We go to the power rankings where some things have changed. Let's talk on the female side first because we still have a full eight people, and there isn't as much shake up there, but there is a little bit. Casey comes in first, of course, and you know, dominating performance from her again this episode, and she's she's the one to beat. She's that good. She just really, really is, and as boring as she might be as a character on the show, she is that good at the game side of it and has built the proper relationships and has all of her friends are the ones that always get invited back along with her. And so she's just solidly in top as almost the same could be said for Tori. Tori remains in number two. I think those two are the two women to beat on the female side. Plus they're in a great spot with their team of even if the for they lose this next week, the first women's elimination will not feature either of them. We'll get to that in the predictions too. Amber in third, she moves up from fifth to third. I, she's going to have to win an elimination or two to do it, assuming her team loses a time or two in, uh, in a daily challenge. But, uh, I think she can win that. And I think she's got a sneaky shot to win the final if she makes it. And I almost like a little bit that she's kind of the, like possibly in position to be the unsung hero of the team that is looked at as like the little scrappers that could like that. Maybe she can like a Jordan can kind of grab her and be like, Hey, we've got me and we've got you. Like, I don't want the rest of the team to forget. Like we've got you, like you're a champion and you're good at all this stuff. So like, let's do this and just hope there's not math, but I got Amber in third. I got Nani in fourth. I got Mariah in fifth, Narice in sixth, Anissa in seventh, Olivia in eighth, only simply because Olivia is just, there's just no way that she's not in multiple eliminations and uh, she might win them. She's won three already. She very well could join Horacio in the four and maybe even five club who knows, but she's going to, I think have to. And so for the time being, just positioned in the game, I move her to the bottom right above her is Anissa, who again, I don't think has any chance of winning a final if she gets there, but she's in a decent position to get there. Narice right above her, Narice and Mariah. I think, you know, they're going to be in an elimination versus each other sooner rather than later. And that leaves Nani in the fourth spot on the men's side. Fessel retain, retains his number one spot. I really think this could, this could be the season for him. I don't think it's going to because I stand by my winner's pick of Devin on the men's side, but 
you know, things are looking slightly more shaky, even though he's playing a good game for Devin, who I've gotten fourth. I've got Bananas second, Jordan third, Devin fourth, Horacio fifth, Nelson sixth, Chauncey seventh, waiting in redemption, Kenny unranked for the time being, but would still remain in eighth. Regardless, Chauncey's definitely, you know, on the out on the bottom of his team and is going to be in some eliminations. Nelson may find himself in that elimination versus Chauncey, which isn't a great time. Those two, you know, very similar skill sets matching up versus each other. And then Horacio, as much as he's going to probably have to go through Devin and Jordan, he's real good. And uh, if he makes a final, he can win the final because I know he, I, I think he can do the endurance part and he's shown all the other parts of the game. So, you know, he's got a shot. Everyone, everyone on the men's side really has a shot. The only one I don't think, I mean, I don't think Kenny can win. I guess maybe, I don't know, maybe can, Kenny can run. And if he comes back in, he gets to be partners with Casey again. So like, maybe, I guess. Chauncey's the only one I'm like, I don't think you can win. I don't, I don't think once, I guess, which I should have said for Amber, I should be thinking about this still as teams. What am I even doing? Well, we, we individual and I already recorded this. So that's what it's going to be. As for predictions, didn't lose anyone from the preseason predictions there yet. Still got three of my five finals picks, Bananas and Nani, Tori and Devin, Chauncey and Amber left. Tori and Devin as the winners who now they will be, if they get there, partnered again. So back on track of like, could they both win? Because I don't think as individuals, they're nearly as strong as they are as a pair because I think they're the best pair standing. But as individuals, I don't feel that way about them. As for the weekly predictions last week, we went two and a half for three. I said Fessel's team wins the first daily in the new format, dominating performance. I said Devin would be the first to scheme with the other team, and he doesn't scheme with them, but he also kind of does, and he's, like, doing strategy stuff with the other team. So, like, I count that one because I'm an easy judge on my own predictions, and I haven't been doing so good this season on my predictions. And then the half point was I said it would be Kenny and Horacio and Mariah and Norris in the elimination because I thought we'd still be eliminating two people versus – zero people in the end uh so i was half right half wrong and i think if it would have been a male and a female i do think that uh well mariah and narisa would have been in there too so i feel like i almost went three for three as for next week mariah's team will win the daily and by mariah's team i mean devin's team because with all due respect that team is devin's team now jordan's gonna want it to be his team they're all gonna feign that you know it's mariah's team because she picked but also she's gonna realize very quickly that she's there's there's a small contingency within the team that's gonna run it and gonna kind of hold the political sway, and uh, she won't be a part of that. So Devin's team is what I'm gonna start calling it, but Mariah's team. Either way, they win the daily. I think it then becomes Anissa versus Olivia in the elimination. Uh, I think a, I don't know who that who who picks who to go in, but I think somehow some way it ends up being that and third and final one. As much as I don't want this to happen, as much as I want this story to go away and these two people to be happy and move past everything that has happened between them, that comment by Tori about Horacio looking real good, I have a weird feeling that the more Jordan does the Norris thing, Tori might start doing a Horacio thing, which I don't know if Horacio will go for it. He had the Laurel thing previously. I don't know, but uh, I think it might think it might happen next week so that's the third and final prediction and that is all for this episode it is time now to put the podcast and the equipment away and turn the tv back on and watch a survivor finale so thanks for being here tonight if you are also watching that survivor finale maybe you're listening to this a couple days later because you watched the finale first because you watch both shows and they're both great and it's a finale so you went first no hard feelings obviously i had to go challenge first but survivor saturdays with page most likely to podcast feed challenge australia again Go on Twitter at Happy Go Locky L O C K Y is a challenge stand account that has a thread that you can easily look up all ten episode links. You can watch all ten episodes, catch up on those recap podcasts. It's a very good season. Go do that. Next week we'll have Ride or Dies plus a top 20 cast members and MVPs of the first 20 seasons on the Christmas break. So that's what's coming up. That's what we went through tonight. Thank you for being here and listening. Hit that follow subscribe button wherever you are listening. Hit that download, automatic download button. That really, really helps the numbers on my end. And as always, thank you. I love you. Hit me up on Instagram if you want to chat challenge. Until we talk again, peace. Peace.